So we've talked about using rigid body constraints, which lets us connect stuff in a lot of cool ways. Press D to duplicate this cube, press T to bring up my tool shelf, then shift select the other cube, press physics control, and then press connect objects. This will turn on rigid body constraints for the two objects I had selected. And this gives us the default constraint type of hinge. Here in the type menu, we have a lot more options than just hinge. The only problem is that a lot of these aren't very intuitive to get working on their own. So what I've done is created a folder of examples for every single one of these different constraint types. And we're going to be going over all of them today so we can get a mastery on how to use these rigid body constraints. So what I recommend you do is click on the link in the description of this video to download the folder of rigid body constraint type examples available at blendersensei.com. And I've got mine in my examples folder in this RB constraints folder, which I have placed into my assets library. So if you have your assets library all set up, you can just go ahead and deposit those in there. And then anytime you need them, you'll have access to these rigid body constraint examples, which you can just click and drag into your 3D view. After connecting these two objects, a rigid body constraint was generated, this hinge type, which is the default type. And if we press play, we'll immediately see the objects hinging around each other like a latch, or if we were to flip this up on its side, it would be like a door. But let's go ahead and examine each of these constraint types uh, straight in a row. So we'll start with the fixed type. So I'll press pause, go back here. So in this rigid body constraints folder that you downloaded, let's start with this fixed example.blend. So I'm gonna click and just drag it into the 3D view. And that just replaces the whole file and opens up that file. So I'm gonna go ahead and close up my assets library for now. So the fixed rigid body constraint type, it will basically let your objects behave as though they have been parented together. And the reason why you would want that is that objects parented within a rigid body physics simulation don't necessarily behave the way that you want them to. So with each one of these example files here, as soon as you load the file, you should be able to press play and just immediately get a demonstration of what each of these constraints will do. So notice here that these three objects, these two cubes and this Suzanne head stay together as though they are parented together. But what happens if we try to parent two rigid body objects? So for instance, if we add a cone here and press add active, and then we double right click over here and add a cylinder and press add active. Say we wanted this cone to stay on top of this cylinder for some reason. So normally to do that, we would select the cone then shift select the cylinder and press parent and these objects would be parented together. So for instance, when we're not doing a simulation and we just select the cylinder and we press G to grab, the cone will follow along because it's been properly parented. However, as soon as we press play, the cone no longer pays attention to the fact that it is parented to the cylinder. To get this to stay parented, we can use this fixed constraint type basically. So we could, under rigid body constraints here with the object selected, we could set this all up manually, but it's much easier to just shift select these two, press connect objects. And of course the default constraint type is a hinge. So we would first want to change that to fixed because that's what we're trying to do in this particular situation. And then next we want to make sure that we turn off this animated value because by default, the animated property is set when we use this connect objects button because it's typically what we want when using connect objects. But in this situation, we do not want that. So now if we press play, we'll notice that the cone stays properly connected to the cylinder. So if I were to say press G to grab and pick up these other fixed objects here, notice it falling and acting as though it were parented properly. And that's basically what we need to do when we want to parent things within a rigid body simulation. So if we click back on a constraint and under the type here, we see the next type we have is point. So let's open up the point example by clicking on our assets library button. And here is the point example here. I'm just gonna click and drag it out into the 3D view to load it and then close up my assets library. So in this example, we'll notice that this object here has been animated. So like all the other example files explaining how these constraint types work, if we just press play, we'll immediately get a demonstration. So what's going on here is we have this kind of weird gyro type thing that spins around. 
and connected to it are all these other objects using point constraints. So if I press pause and go back here and we click on one of these constraint types, we'll see that the type is set to point. Point is similar to hinge, only rather than restricting the axes that the object can rotate to just one, it allows the object to rotate around in X, Y, and Z, basically making it behave like a free range a connected object. We could press B to do a border select and delete all that. I'm gonna go ahead and hide my camera out of the 3D view because I don't care to see that. We could press Shift A, add a cube, and then we could press Alt D to do a link duplicate of this cube and shift select and then press connect objects. This of course will get set up a basic hinge constraint type. However, the constraint is not pointing in the direction it normally does because normally when I do this, I'm starting in front view. So if I press one to go into front view, we can see that we actually did this from the right view here. But if we press five to go in top view and just press R to rotate this constraint, hold control as we're rotating to get the angle to constrain how we want and then we press play, we'll see this basic hinge constraint in action here. But if we were to switch this to point and press play, it appears to be doing about the same until we have something act on it, then we'll see that it will rotate around however it wants. So if I were to say shift right click to snap my 3D cursor to the top of that face, press shift A, add a torus, pick this up, move it over a little bit, and press add active and press play, then press G to immediately grab it. Notice how when I hit this cube around with this torus shape that it's spinning in all different directions, whereas a hinge, it would only go behave like a hinge, like a latch or a door or something. We can of course extend this in whatever way. We can add new objects or we could just press D or Alt D to do a link duplicate to add this way and then shift select the last object used and press connect objects. And I'll press play. We'll see this moving all about like that. So that's the point constraint type. So moving along here, we have hinge, which is the basic type that's set up whenever we connect objects. But let's go ahead and see what we've got in the example file. So I'll click open my assets library and drag out my hinge example here. And I'm just going to go ahead and close up my assets library. As with all these examples, we can just immediately press play to get a demonstration of how these constraints work. And you can see here, we've got two hinge examples. One, we've got this little kind of hammer object hinged to this cube, which has the animated property going. So it can be a part of this rigid body physics simulation and be animated, uh, but this object is hinged to it. And then the other hinge we have set up to basically work like a door opening here. So if we press pause, go back, let's go ahead and delete everything here and I'll show you how to set up a door like this. So we'll press A, press X to delete everything, Shift C to recenter our 3D cursor, press Shift A. I'm going to add a cube here. Let's press S to scale, middle mouse to constrain, and we'll just make kind of a similar sort of wall type deal here. Press Tab to go into edit mode and Shift W to do an edge loop cut while in edit mode, scroll it up to get two cuts. Go ahead, click there to confirm those and shift W again to do another edge loop cut, but bring this up a bit higher like this. So what we want to do is just select this face here, press X to delete it and select that bottom face there, press X to, de to delete that. And then I'm going to select this back face here and press shift D to create an object from selection. And I'm going to press E to extrude it out which looks like when I did that, I inversed my normal. So if I double tap tab to quickly look at everything, I can see that these normals aren't facing the directions I want. So let's press A to select all those and press our mesh cleanup button and fix normals down here. So I'll double tap tab to get everything back and then press tab to go into object mode, then select the wall. And let's go ahead and press double tap tab to get that by itself. Press tab to go into edit mode, select that back face there, press X to delete. Then we want to shift scroll up for edge selection and shift select these two edges here, press F to fill those faces, shift select those two edges there, press F to fill those faces and uh, shift select these two edges and press F to fill those two faces. Now we have our simple kind of wall and if we double tap tab to get everything back and press tab once more to get back into object mode, we have our basic door here. 
And if, while I'm trying to scroll in and out, it looks like my scrolling's getting a little bit wonky. And if ever that happens, just press Alt and Middle Mouse button to zoom in on your selection and that will fix your scrolling. So we're gonna need a few things to get this door hinge to behave properly. First of all, we're gonna want to set the door's origin point over to the side where we want the hinge to be. So let's go ahead and double tap tab, which puts us into quick hide mode and hides everything but the objects we have selected. So what we're gonna to need to do is get the origin position to where we want the hinge to be. So that's going to be right on this outer side of this door. So what we're gonna do is first shift right click to see where our cursor is going to snap to this edge here, and then shift double right click there to move the origin point to the location where we have snapped our cursor to. So now if we double tap tab to get out of quick hide mode, we'll see that the origin point is where we want. So that's good. Now we need with the door selected, we need to shift select the wall, press connect objects, and of course we get the default hinge type. First of all, I wanna press three to go into right view and select our hinge again, and press R to rotate, control to constrain the rotation. The whole point of this constraint being in the shape of an arrow is so we can know which direction things will rotate around it. So, okay, now that we know that the pole is facing up this way, let's press this button here, which will snap whatever objects we have selected to where the cursor is. And since the cursor happens to be where we set the door's origin point to, that is convenient. So let's click on that, press that, and this moves the hinge to the location of where we want the hinge on the door. So now if we press play, we'll notice nothing's happening, but if we were to double right click and add say another cube here and press add active and maybe scale it down. And then immediately after we press play, press G to grab it so it doesn't fall to oblivion. And then we can use it to smack this door around. We can see we've got this door object behaving like an actual door, which is good. Now, one thing you'll notice is that by default, the constraint is set up to disable collisions with the stuff contained within itself. So that's why the door goes into the wall, but we can fix that. We can press pause, go back here, and then select on the constraint itself and turn off disable collisions. Now, if we select our cube, which we're basically using to bat stuff around, and let's see, bring our cube back up here, give, us, <laughs> give ourselves a second to grab it, or we could just press shift C to bring our cursor to the center, press Shift A and under Mesh, add a plane, S to scale, and just use this as a floor by pressing Add Passive. Then when we press Play, we'll see that the door is behaving properly and is not running into the wall when it gets smacked into the wall. One other thing going on with this is that when we press Play, we can see that it's immediately swung open. What's happening there is that it's colliding with the top and the sides of this wall. So to keep it from doing that, what we can actually do is click on the wall itself and you would want to change the shape of the door, of course, to mesh and the shape of the wall to mesh as well. And it looks like it's still having a little trouble flying open. So what we might do is press back here, click on the door, and we may want to give ourselves just a little bit of space in the top and sides so this isn't flying open so crazily. So we could select the wall there and select this interface here, press space to make sure we're in face selection, press Z to go into wireframe mode and press Z to bring that up just a hair. And do the same thing with this face over here, press G to grab, middle mouse to constrain, just bring it over just a hair. And that should do it. If we press tab to go into edit mode, press back, press free all, press play. We'll notice that the door is now doing just fine. It's staying, staying still. But if we select this cube and grab and hit on it, we can get it, uh, the hinge to move and to move the door, which is sweet. So if we click on this constraint and we click on type, the next type we have is slider. So let's come down to our assets library and find the slider example and click and just drag it into the 3D view. Close up our assets library here like all the other example files, if we just press play, we can get a demonstration of what's going on with these sliders. So we've got two slider examples here. We've got one set up to be knocked back and forth between these two objects and then one that is kind of falling here. 
Okay, so if we were going to make a slider from scratch, we could double right click, add a cube, and then Alt D to duplicate that cube or use any other object we wanted, it doesn't really matter. Then we would shift select these two objects under physics control, connect objects. And of course the default constraint type we're given is hinge. So if we set this to slider, and we see this looks pretty similar to this one over here, but then we press play, we'll notice that nothing's happening. And if we click on the top cube there, press G to grab, bring it up, press play, give it a little more distance to fall, we still notice nothing's happening. With the slider, the axis of the constraint becomes really important. So typically the constraint, which is actually just what we call an empty, if you double right click over here, you'll see you can add an empty, which is just a graphical representation in the 3D view to basically represent a point in space. But by default, when we connect objects to add a hinge, we get this arrow shape and this is really useful when using a hinge because this lets us know if the constraints pointing that way then things are going to rotate around it hinge around it this way or if it's pointing up things are going to go left to right around it but for with a slider it's a bit more complicated which is why i don't really like to use sliders and i'll show you a much easier method than using sliders in a minute if we change the display over here in our object properties to arrows and we go ahead and switch this one over here to arrows as well. Then we can sort of figure out which direction our arrows need to face to get the slider to work. So if we see on the working one that X is faced that way and that Z is faced that way. So basically we got to get this to look the same way as this one. Or if we wanted a left to right slider, we'd have to get ours to, to face the same direction as that one, which is pretty confusing. So what we need to do here is, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my manipulation widget and just use the rotation bit of it. So what we need to do is get this X turned up, click here, hold control. As you can see, getting us to work is kind of a pain. So we'll rotate that, hold control to constrain it. And there we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off that widget because it's a bit cumbersome. But basically we've got this constraint facing in the same direction as this one down here with the X flat up that way and the Z on its side looking like an N basically there. So now if we press back and press play, we'll see that the slider is working. Of course, by default, the collisions are disabled. So let's turn that back on. And so now everything involved in this collision will work. So this cube stops when it hits this bottom cube. And of course the bouncing just comes from having the bounciness properties turned up so if we were going to emulate that we would go back click on each one of these objects click on the physics tab of our properties panel and then under rigid body collisions increase the bounciness for both of these objects so if we press play this one will bounce in fact it will bounce a bit more than that one because we have the bounciness for both of these objects involved uh, set up really high so good god was that cumbersome to get that slider to work so Rather than using a slider constraint, a much easier way to basically emulate a slider constraint is just to, under the dimensions, lock the axis of movement that you want for each object. So for instance, if we were to press Shift C to recenter our cursor, press Shift A and under Mesh, add a plane, so we could have a sort of a ground here. And under Physics, press Add Passive. So say we're to just, I'm gonna hold Alt to temporarily dis disable 3D, cursor snapping and double right click here and add a cube. And let's say press add active, then press D to duplicate that. Okay, so we've got these two cubes over here. When we press play, they just fall. So if I wanted this cube to behave like this cube that can only move up and down, which is all the slider really does, all I would do is under dimensions, under location, I would lock X and Y location, meaning that this cube can only go up and down along the Z axis. So if we were to then open up our physics control, press play, and then I were to pick up this cube over here and press G to grab, notice that however I bounce this cube, it can only go up and down. No matter if I hit it from the left or the right, it's still just gonna go up and down. Now right now it's rotating in any direction we want, which you may actually want, it may actually be pretty sweet, but we can also fix that to where it works completely like a regular slider. All we do is press pause, Go back. It's getting a little hard to see, so I'm going to turn on high def shading here, make things a little nicer. So we would click on the dimensions tab, 
and then just lock all of the rotation, which is what the slider does. It locks all the rotation. And now if we press play, and I use this other object to kind of bat this one around, notice that this object can only now move like the slider object. And if we want to adjust it, rather than having to fiddle with you know this axis and figuring out however crazily it needs to be turned, we can just head back over to our dimensions tab, click on the object, and change the location locking. So say we only want it to go you know, along the X axis, we would lock Y and Z and then unlock X. And so now if we press play and we pick up our kind of batting object, we see that the object is only moving along the X axis. So if I press play again, G to grab, I can just bat this back and forth here, which is pretty sweet. So that's really all the slider does. It's sort of way easier to just use the built-in location or rotation locking of each individual object's transform properties than actually use the slider, in my opinion anyway. But if ever you need the example for that, it's always here in your rigid body constraint examples. So if we click on one of these constraints and close up dimensions and back in the physics control tab, under type, above slider, we have piston. So let's go ahead and pull out our piston example turn on our assets library button here, find the piston example here, click it and drag it out into our 3D view here. And I'll go ahead and close up my assets library. Like all the other example files, we can just press play to immediately see what's going on here. And so as you can see, there's really nothing special to the piston. So the actual piston constraint is this one here, which is spinning around. Basically, it's just a slider type with one of its rotation axes enabled rather than disabled. So press Shift-C to recenter our cursor, Shift-A and press Mesh and add a plane. And go ahead and select all of this stuff and move it up here, move it over to the side maybe, and select our plane and press Add Passive. We could emulate this if say I were to press D to duplicate this, and right now if I press play, this thing just falls because it doesn't have any of the constraints working on it, but we could emulate the constraint going on over there just by locking all the location axes but the X one because X goes this way back and forth as we can see from our little widget there pointing, telling us that's the basic X direction there. So we would lock everything but X and press Shift A add a cube, we'll use this little cube again, press add active on it, and if I press play here and pick up my little batting cube, notice that this is moving along but it's rotating in all those different directions. However, if I were to select it and under dimensions, lock its rotation, let's see which, which direction would it need to be locked. I think everything but X, that might not be right. And press back, press play, G to grab, Let's see, I need to be able to pick this up, press play to get the simulation started. There we go, yeah. So we can see we've got, we've got this doing the same exact thing as a piston constraint, and all we did was lock some dimensions of the location and rotation and stuff like that. So yeah, you can create a piston and you can create a slider using the rigid body constraints, but to me it's kind of a pain when you can just kind of manually set this stuff up like this. So I'll close that up. Moving along here, if we click on our constraint under our physics control and select type, right above piston we have generic. And so generic basically lets you call the shots on how you want things to be constrained. There may be some advantages to that, but basically that's like doing what we've been doing in this past example, just locking various ways that the object can move or rotate or scale by locking these X, Y, Z values for location, rotation, and scale. Basically the same thing going on with the generic type. But if we come down here in our assets library, I've got a sort of example of one of those. We can just click this generic example and drag it out into the 3D view. So like with the rest, if we press play, We'll see we've got this one cube here, part of the rigid body simulation animated with, with the, these four keyframes to make it move, then spin around. 
And we can see how the generic setup of this particular constraint will only allow the object to move back and forth in those directions. So once the inertia gets going from this thing spinning, it kind of spins it back and forth, which is pretty sweet. But if we click on the constraint itself over here under rigid body constraint in the physics tab, we can see what I've got going on here is just these Y, Z, X, Y, and Z values locked. And then their values set to zero for upper and lower. So it's basically just a way to have a little bit more control than hard deadlocking the ways the object can move or rotate or scale with these locks here under the dimensions tab. Okay, if we close the dimensions tab with our constraint selected under physics control under type here, above generic, we have generic spring. And so if we go ahead and come down to our assets library, let's bring that out into the 3D view by clicking and dragging it out into the 3D view and that opens up that file. Now the generic spring actually is very useful. So just like all the other files, we can press play to immediately get a demonstration of these constraints. So here we have two different spring constraint examples. One you can see is very rigid and won't rotate or anything like that and will only basically bounce up and down in one direction. The other one's very freeform. It's behaving much more like it's on a bungee cord with the ability to move back and forth and stuff like that. So let's take a look at what's going on with these spring constraints. So let's click on this first one here and over in our physics tab under rigid body constraint, which is what we're using this empty here for. We've got all the different limits that come with the generic rigid body physics constraint type, but then these additional spring ones. So what these limits do is basically the same thing as locking any regular dimension uh, of your object does. Basically after that, when you animate it, it won't move in a certain direction or it won't rotate in a certain direction. Or when you're editing it for say, for instance, I double right click over here and add a monkey head. Say whenever I press R to rotate, I only ever want this monkey head to rotate along the Z axis. I could lock X and Y rotation. Now, no matter how I'm looking at this, if I press R to rotate, it's only ever going to rotate along the Z axis because it's locked. If I click back on this constraint here, all this generic constraint stuff, it does exactly the same thing. So this is the location stuff, XYZ location, then XYZ rotation. For this constraint, dealing with this spring we got going on with these two cubes here, we want everything locked but the X axis which if we change the display of this uh, constraint type to arrows here, we'll see that X is what's pointing down. So X is the up and down axis in this particular situation, the one we want free to bounce up and down. And then under springs, we also have X as selected as the value for which we want a spring to be affected. So if we click over to this constraint, you can see here we have none of the location stuff restricted and none of the rotation stuff restricted. And then we have spring values set for everything. So that's why this spring mechanism is very rigid, will only go in one direction basically, whereas the other one's totally freeform. So we could say adjust these. I could click on this one and maybe allow for just X rotation here. And so I'll go ahead and use this uh, Suzanne head as kind of like my uh, batting object. Make sure it's not locked. Okay, it's not. And I'll press add active on it. Then I'll go ahead, press shift C to recenter my cursor, shift A and under mesh add a plane. So I've got a ground for stuff to fall on and press add passive. So it'll be a part of the whole show here. And go ahead and turn high def shading back on, press play. Uh, so now if I pick up this Suzanne head, press G to grab, you can see that this cube is springing up and down, but now it will also spin. Although it's not really having much of a chance to spring because this floor is so close. Let's press pause, go back, select the ground, G to grab. Let's bring it way down here, or maybe a little less far down. And now if we press play, we'll see the spring working. If I pick up the Suzanne head, we can see though now that this object can also rotate in, in that direction that we allowed it to, in addition to be used as a spring. We could just sit here and bat this. That's fun. <laughs> I found a game. Uh, you'll notice that this is going up through its constraint object there. And that's because disable collisions is turned on by default. Uh, so we could click this and turn that off. 
And so now if we press play and then grab our Suzanne head, it will actually stop when it hits the upper cube there. So we could go ahead and real quickly build uh, one of these from scratch. So what I'll do is press B to do a border select and select all the spring stuff up here, press X to delete it. And then I'm gonna press five to go into top view and it looks like everything's pretty square. Press G to grab and bring this up here. Thought I had that Suzanne head selected, but I didn't. I'll press G to grab, bring it up. Five to go into top view. And I just wanna bring it over here somewhere because I'm gonna use it once again as my little batting object. Okay, so if I double right click here and add a cube, and then I press D to add another cube, so I can shift select these. Although this object up here is the one I want to stay stationary. Uh, so I'll select the object that I want to be moving around first, then shift select the object that I want to be stationary. And under physics control here, press connect objects. So now if I press play, whoops, uh, Suzanne had got knocked away over there. Let's press back, press free all to make sure the physics cache is reset. So if we press play here, this is of course default type of hinge. So if I pick up the Suzanne head, press G to grab. Well, it's not working through it. And I'm guessing that's because this one is set to uh, animated. Whichever of these objects is set to animated whenever you connect them will be the one that stays still. So to switch that around, all you do is turn animated off on that one then select this object and turn animated back on. And now this will be the one that's gonna move for us. So if I press G to grab, we'll see this one uh, rotating. Okay, so let's set this up to be a spring now rather than a hinge. So we select the constraint, change its type to generic spring here. And of course, in our physics tab here under rigid body constraint, which is what this empty has now become here, we have the limits for location, rotation, and then which axis do we want to use as a spring. So let's go ahead and change the display of this empty here from this single arrow to arrows. And so we can see that actually in this particular instance that the up and down bit is the Y axis. So Y is gonna be the direction in which we want springiness to happen. So what we would wanna do is turn on that value and then we could press play. And that's a good start. We can see that this is actually behaving like a spring. If I pick up my Suzanne head, press G to grab, you'll see that it's kind of floating away uh, over that way uh, as though it's kind of a buoy on a water. And that's because we don't have any restrictions on location. So if we click back on the constraint and we go ahead and limit everything but the Y axis there and we press back and press play again. And now this time if we try to bat it around uh, we'll see that it's still able to rotate in whatever direction it wants, but it's not going anywhere. It's gonna, its spring value is gonna be constrained to just the Y axis, which is good. So I press pause and go back. Okay, so to get it to stop from bouncing around everywhere, what we would wanna do is just go ahead and restrict all of the angles here. So now if we press back and press play, select this monkey head, press G to grab, and try to bounce it around. Well, it's still got a bit of give, so let's pause and click back on the constraint. We would want to go ahead and set all of these to zero. Or if you were looking for a little more subtle results, you would just wanna lower these to near zero, I suppose. And that may give you just a tad bit of realistic give. Press free all to make sure the simulation's reset. Press G to grab. And notice that this is no longer going in any other direction but up there. We could click on the constraint and turn off disable collisions. So now it, it gets bumped into the thing that it's starting from and what have you. All right, so that's pretty much it for springs. Let's go ahead and if we click on the constraint, we can see under type here, the last one we've got is motor. So let's go ahead and drop down to our assets library and find the motor example, which is here. Let's click it and drag it out into the 3D view, let go, and this will open up this file. So let's go ahead and close our assets library and let's take a look at what we got here. So I really wish that this finale were a little more cool. In actuality, the motor constraint type doesn't really do a lot. It basically performs the same thing as animating a rotation or something pushing onto something else. So if we go ahead and press play, 
we've got two different examples of the motor constraint type, but the way that I have set up this little scene, it almost looks like one kind of example, like maybe this little engine here is actually cranking this lift. I suppose it would have looked a bit more like that had I actually put it closer to the uh, lift itself, but it's basically for demonstration purposes. So we've got two different types of motor momentum being used here. One is angular and the other is linear. So if we pause and go back here, so if we click on this one and we take a look over at our rigid body constraint, you can see the type is set to motor. And then we have these, the basic which objects are involved in the constraint kind of deal, which is of course this gear thing and the actual motor thing itself. We click back on the constraint. And then we have two options for a linear motor for pushing velocity basically and then angular motor for spinning velocity so we have the the angular motor activated here and the target set to one that basically means uh, when i'm going steady how much force should i be using and this maximum value is saying well how much value can i apply if i need to get to where i'm going steady <laughs> basically what it boils down to is that the motor constraint type is, is just basically going to spin things or push things involving you know rigid body group stuff where this could be particularly pretty useful is that it's actually you know a continuous motion that you don't have to animate so for instance if we were to select this kind of gear here i'll press alt tap middle mouse to zoom in on it and say i were to press d to duplicate this and put it up here and say right click my cursor here to get it to snap press shift a mesh to add a cylinder shape and i'll press one to go into front view r to rotate control to constrain s to scale this down so maybe this is you know something else for this to be spinning on and we could select this and select add passive so this will be stuck into 3d space and we could uh, press add active for this one, and if we press play, we'll see the uh, motor spin that gear. Of course, we didn't really set any way for this not to get blown off course. We could make a, a sort of a, a cap here. We could extrude this out and then uh, press space and alt select this loop of faces here. Press E to extrude, S to scale, S to scale that in so that it you know doesn't get knocked off next time. So something like that. Uh, but that's not <laughs> that's not particularly pretty looking. Uh, we could press pause, go back. Easy thing we could do is just use constraints under the dimensions tab. So what we would want to do is stop this thing from moving anywhere basically and just let it rotate. So we could lock X, Y, Z location. And now if we press play, this thing's only going to spin. Although it, we probably don't want it spinning that way either. We probably want to lock some of that uh, spinning too. So we would want to lock everything, but it's spinning around the X axis here. You can see down here with our little widget that X is the closest thing to this direction of this shaft type deal. So we would want to under rotation lock all but X axis. I think that's right. Maybe I'm right. And now if we press play, now this guy's doing what he's supposed to, which we like. Of course, we could give a little more love to these gears here to, you know, editing them, going to edit mode and make sure that they're, you know, working in the way they need to. But I think you get the basic idea here of how you can use constraints, both the actual constraints that we add by connecting objects and also just the objects basic constraints that we use for lots of things to help us out when animating and actually, you know, positioning and designing things in Blender as well. Let's so press pause and go back here. So real quickly before we go, let's go ahead and set up a motor constraint type from scratch so we can see what's going on. I'll press shift C to recenter my cursor, press shift A and under mesh add a plane. Go ahead and just give us a nice little ground here. Press add passive and I'll press shift A to add a cylinder shape G to grab and I'll just scale it up a bit like this, make it scale long ways. We could press tab to go into edit mode, select this top face of the cylinder here and then just press shift D, which creates an object from selection, which would be nice in this situation. And then E to extrude that and then space for face selection. Alt select these faces here, press E to extrude, S to scale, you know, something like this. Then we could press control E to do an individual extrude and change our pivot type to individual origins, which will rather than scale all of these inward together, it will scale them each around their own little individual 
point in the center of each of those selected faces. So we could press S to scale that. And then we could press space for face selection, X to delete the top and bottom face belonging to that. And then shift scroll up for edge selection and alt select this loop of edges up here. Then shift alt select this loop of edges down there. Press F to bridge those. Now when we press tab to go back into edit mode, got this kind of basic gear and I'll just flatten it a little bit by pressing S to scale and middle mouse to constrain. Okay, so if I were to select this kind of shaft deal, then shift select this gear, I could then press connect objects and which gives us the default type of hinge. So if we press play, this is not what we want to happen. So let's go back. First of all, let's change the constraint to motor. And then we would want to enable one of these types. So let's enable the angular motor. So now if we press play, we see this guy is moving around, but not exactly how we want. <laughs> this is a little weird. So we would want to adjust this. So let's press pause and go back. So first of all, we're probably gonna want to rotate this to where it's pointing vertically. So I'll press three to go into right view, R to rotate, control to constrain, get that you know pointing straight up. Let's press play now and it's still not going in the direction we want. So how do we get it to do that? Well, what we need to do is go ahead and switch this from single arrow to arrows, which gives us the direction that it's pointing in, and then figure out in what way do we need to get this thing to rotate to where it spins properly. So let's just do trial and error. I'm gonna click on this, and I'm going to turn on my manipulation widget and uh, click it to move it this way, hold control to constrain. And let's see, does that fix it? Nope, let's try another direction. How about this? Yay, that fixes it. Although it starts falling straight down into oblivion, which we don't want. We would probably wanna lock this guy in a similar way we locked this one up here. So under our dimensions, we don't want this thing moving up and down. We know that much. So, so let's lock all but the X axis here and press play. And that seems to do it for us. However, we do have disable collisions on, which means this gear won't be testing for collisions with this kind of cone shaft object. I'm gonna turn off my manipulator widget because it's annoying. However, collisions will still work with anything else. So for instance, if we were to close that up and pause and go back and say, shift right click to snap my cursor here and add something like say another a torus shape here and we'll press W to give that some smoothing, press add active if we press play. Well, it is, why is it stopped there? Let's press cheetah grad, let's move it up. Let's press free all to reset our physics simulation. I guess it's just falling straight on it, so I'll just move it over a little bit. The point is to show that this thing will still be affecting stuff in the rigid body physics world. There we go. See, it, it does affect it. Actually, that's showing us we should probably um, go ahead and limit the rotation of this gear in some other ways too. So under dimensions, we would probably want to lock, see it spinning around that, if we press back, we see it spinning around that x-axis, so we wanna lock everything but the x-axis rotation. So if we press play, whoops, uh, that's not right, hmm. Which one is it we need here? Z maybe? Or everything but Z? Yeah, well, everything but Z and probably go ahead and lock x-axis on the location there. And let's see, that does it, that does it for us. That makes us a working motory thing that will do stuff such as spin gears and be awesome and fun. So this was a super long tutorial, but man, have I been wanting to cover all these constraint types for a long time. It's something that I've been gradually gaining understanding about, but I've never gone this far in depth with it. So I hope this tutorial was somewhat enlightening and I hope it helps you be able to create crazy new inventions or super cool animations or build some kind of spaceship or who knows what. So thanks for watching and stick around for more.